3D games encompass a massive range of topics. These topics range from physically based rendering, to calculating the physics in a simulated world, to just figuring out if the player's touching the ground, whatever that is. One of the fundamental structures in OpenGL that helps build these immersive 3D worlds is something called buffers. At the end of the day, 3D games are simply a transformation of some input data to some output data. And today, we will be learning how we can represent that data on a graphics card with the help of OpenGL. Like I said before, buffers are a fundamental concept in OpenGL. So if you can understand buffers conceptually and how they work, you already know most of what there is to learn in OpenGL. So with that said, what is a buffer and how can we use them? If we think about 3D games, you'll see the world represented on a 2D screen. The world is actually representing your program as a series of mathematical calculations that end up creating some sort of game world space. So how do we take the 3D game world and convert it to the 2D screen to display it to the user? Well, we can use some linear algebra to transform all these objects into a 2D image. This process is called rasterization, and the GPU is very good at this. In OpenGL, the way we transform this data to a 2D image is by going through the graphics pipeline process. There are a few stages to this, passing data to the vertex shader, optional tessellation, optional geometry shader processing, primitive assembly, rasterization, and finally fragment shading and final tests. Let's talk about each of these stages very briefly. So the very first thing OpenGL needs is our vertex data. Vertex data is simply the data about 3D points that create our 3D objects. These points can contain metadata, such as which texture is applied at this point, what color this point should be, and whatever other arbitrary data you want to attach to this. One common feature among vertex data is a position, although you don't need to send position data if you don't want to. This vertex data is then processed in a required shader stage called the vertex shader. The vertex shader is where we perform mathematical calculations to transform these vertices from world space to 2D screen space. If you're familiar with linear algebra, then this should be fairly intuitive. But if you aren't, you don't need to understand the details to understand how the overall process works. The way we transform vertices from world space to screen space is typically through a series of matrix math. The programmer will typically pass in the object's transformation matrix, a projection matrix, and a view matrix. And then we multiply all these together with the object's model data to transform the data into 2D screen space. This is great. But it's absolute nonsense if you don't know what any of these terms mean. What's a transformation matrix? A projection matrix? And what the heck is a view matrix? Well, I like to think of the projection matrix as a description of how you would like to project the world onto a 2D screen. Think of a projector. What does it do? It projects a film onto a 2D wall. This is almost the same thing as a projection matrix. The projection matrix typically contains details such as the field of view, which describes how wide our camera angle is. It also contains the near plane and the far plane, which describe how close or far away an object can get to the camera before it's clipped out of our view. The projection matrix can also be defined differently for 2D games versus 3D games. For 2D games, you'll usually use an orthographic projection matrix, which removes any sort of perspective from the scene. And a perspective matrix adds that perspective back in. Check out an article I wrote a while ago in the description for more details about how cameras work in OpenGL. What about the view matrix? Well, simply put, this is what the camera is viewing. I know, programmers come up with very creative names for this stuff. You can usually define the view matrix by specifying an eye, which is basically the camera's lens position and a direction that the camera is pointing in. Using these two features, we can create a view matrix which describes where our camera is located in world space and where it's looking. Finally, we have the transformation matrix. This literally transforms our object from local coordinates to world coordinates. You see, it's much easier to work with an object by pretending it's located at the origin of the world. When you use 3D software, you do this all the time. Then after we finish working on the object as if it was located at the origin, we would like to place it somewhere in our world. This is transforming our object from the origin to its actual position in the world. The transformation matrix simply contains the details of where the object should be in the world, how it should be rotated, and what the scale of the object should be. Using linear algebra, we can multiply these matrices together to transform all of our object's vertex data, which is in local space, 
and to normalize device coordinates, which is the normalized 2D positions on our screen. In OpenGL, the normalized device coordinates range from negative 1 to 1 in the x and y directions. This makes it very easy for the GPU to multiply all these values to whatever the user's screen resolution is to get the pixels in the correct location. This all sounds very complicated, but in practice, it usually ends up being just a handful of lines of code if you're using a math library to handle all the details for you. Once the vertex shader transforms our data into normalized device coordinates, we move on to the next stage of the pipeline, which is optional tessellation. The next stage of the pipeline is tessellation, if you've written a tessellation shader. Now, I'll admit that I'm not well versed in how tessellation works, but you can read some great articles linked in the description for more details. The basic premise is that if you send in vertex data and process it using your vertex shader, you can then break that data up into even more vertices using this tessellation shader. The catch is, these extra vertices will always be interpolated in the current primitive. That means if the current primitive is a triangle, the tessellation will only add vertices within the triangle. If the primitive is a line, it will only add tessellation within the line. After the optional tessellation stage is the optional geometry shader processing stage. The geometry shader stage is where you can dynamically add or remove primitives and emit completely new geometry on the GPU. I'm not that familiar with geometry processing stage either, so I will not discuss this much further. As far as I know, this stage has shown detrimental performance and is not typically used in real-time applications like games. Next, OpenGL performs the primitive assembly. This process is completely controlled by OpenGL, so you don't have to worry too much about the details. Basically, in OpenGL, there are a few different types of primitives, or the simplest objects that the GPU can rasterize. The three main primitives, and I'm not aware of any other primitives, are points, lines, and triangles. Why these three shapes? Well, it turns out we can use these three shapes to represent any other shape imaginable, or at least make it look very close to another shape. Another reason they operate primarily on triangles is because of certain mathematical properties that make them very easy to work with. Check out this discussion by Jonathan Blow for a great in-depth look at the processing that goes on behind the scenes. So, OpenGL will assemble the vertex data that you've passed in into one of these three primitives at this point. It will do a few other things like clipping the geometry to the viewplane and culling geometry that's not visible. After this, the GPU performs rasterization. During this stage, the GPU simply converts all the clipped primitives into fragments. A fragment is basically a pixel, but the reason there's a distinction is because a fragment could technically cover more than one pixel or less than a single pixel on the screen, depending on a lot of factors. OpenGL will perform some magic to render these fragments to the correct color on every single pixel when the time comes to render these to the actual window. Finally, OpenGL performs the required fragment shading in any final test. Fragment shading is the process of coloring in every single fragment on the screen. The fragment shader is a required step by the programmer to ensure OpenGL knows how to color in the pixel. The GPU will take whatever fragment shader the programmer has supplied and run the shader on millions of pixels in parallel. Every single one of these pixels will interpolate any data that was passed into them, unless specified otherwise, and then perform the instructions in the shader to output a color, or some other programmer specified data. I briefly mentioned how a math library would be helpful for a lot of these processes. So very quickly, if you're coding in C++, I would recommend GLM as a math library, which is graphics library math. Of course, you can use any library you prefer. If you're in Java, I would recommend JAML, which is Java OpenGL math library. And if you're in C Sharp, I would recommend OpenTK's built-in library. Right now would be a good time to add your desired math library to your project. All right, let's continue. Okay, I just went off on a huge tangent there. What does any of this have to do with buffers? Well, if you remember what I said about the first stage, that's vertex processing. Well, how do we get our vertex data to the GPU and OpenGL? Well, using buffers, of course. So what is a buffer and how do we use it? In OpenGL, a buffer can represent pretty much any data you can think of. The buffer is literally just a block of memory on the GPU that's used for different things like storing vertex data or textures. In OpenGL, there are specific buffer types that represent different processes. There are three very commonly used buffers in OpenGL. They are GL Array Buffer, GL Element Array Buffer, and GL Texture Buffer. These buffers are a way to represent an array of data, elements, which we'll discuss shortly, or texture, 
which is usually just an image like a PNG or JPEG or something. There are many other types of buffers though, and we'll take a look at a couple more in time. Some of the more commonly used buffer objects are the GL draw indirect buffer, which is a buffer to store rendering commands, the GL shader storage buffer, which is a special buffer to pass data to shaders, the GL transform feedback buffer, which is a special buffer commonly used to do complex calculations on the GPU like particle simulations, and the GL uniform buffer, which is another buffer used to pass data to shaders. Let's talk about two of the most common buffers. You can find all the different buffers documentation available in the description. We'll talk about the array buffers and element buffers in this video, and we'll talk about the texture buffer once we get to the episode on textures. Remember, the task we want to accomplish is sending vertex data to the GPU. How do we do that? Well, we can use array buffers and element buffers to accomplish this. Array buffers can be created in OpenGL by using these three commands in sequence. Now is a good time to mention that OpenGL basically acts like a giant state machine. What I mean by this is that many different commands in OpenGL mutate some global state. If you're familiar with OOP, this is essentially like having a member function on an object that modifies some private member data. Because of this, we often have to set up that global state before we perform certain operations. And this can become a very big headache if you're not careful. All right, let's continue talking about array buffers. There's a couple key things to notice in this sequence of commands. The first thing is that we have to refer to the buffer by its ID. In OpenGL, all buffer objects are tracked by a unique ID that describes that buffer. We need to hold on to this ID so that if we ever want to modify that specific buffer, we have a way to access it. This means that there are a set of commands you can use that are similar to the commands we saw above, except we refer to the object directly by its name, which is its ID. So we could achieve the same thing by doing this. You'll notice that with this version, we don't have to specify the buffer type. The reason we don't have to specify the buffer type is because OpenGL can implicitly infer what the type is, since it has the buffer ID. This method of buffering data is a bit safer since you aren't relying on any global state to be set, but it's only available since OpenGL 4.5, which means you can't target all hardware using this technique unless it supports OpenGL 4.5. I'll talk about how you can buffer data using named functions in a moment. Now, I kind of glossed over a detail there. There's a parameter at the end of these calls called usage. What is usage? Well, we can help OpenGL out a bit by letting it know what we intend to do with this data. If we intend to send this data to the GPU and never touch it again, we can use the type GL static draw. If we intend to update this data commonly and never read the data, we can use the usage type GL dynamic draw. There are a few other types of usage that you can find in the documentation and learn more about. Okay. So we've created a buffer on the GPU and possibly uploaded that data as well. But how do we use that data on the GPU? Well, we can use the data that we have passed using a vertex shader and a fragment shader. We'll talk more about shaders in the next episode, but for now, let's assume we would like to send specific pieces of data to the shader. Say for instance, that we want to send the position and color of the vertex. We can send the position as three floats and the color as four floats. In the vertex shader, we could write something like this. The main thing to focus on is the lines that start with layout. We are basically saying that we expect a vertex attribute to exist at these specific locations specified by the shader. So we expect a vertex to contain two attributes, a position and a color. I like to specify my input variables with an A to denote that these are attribute variables and specify my output variables with an F to denote that these are being sent to the fragment shader. Once again, We'll talk about this in more detail in the next episode. So how do we tell the GPU that our buffer is going to contain vertex data that's three floats followed by four floats, which represent a position followed by a color? Well, we can use a function called glVertexAttrib pointer. Let's talk about what these parameters are. This function takes an index first. This index is the layout location in your vertex shader that you would like to use. So. If we specified that our vertex attribute a color was at layout location equals five, we would use five for the index in this function call. Next up, we have size. This is the number of components that this attribute has. For instance, if we wanted to pass a vec three, we would use three for the size. The documentation specifies that the size must be one, two, three, or four for a basic data type, a vec two, a vec three, or a vec four respectively. After that, we have the type. This is the type of data being passed in. So 
If you were passing a VEC3, you would pass GL float as the data type. If you were passing an IVEC3, which is an integer vector, you would pass GL int. Then we get a boolean called normalized. This flag specifies whether you'd like the data being passed in to be normalized or not if it's an integer being converted to a float. This will normalize the value based on the size of the integer. So if you passed in an 8-bit unsigned integer and wanted to normalize it, it would divide the value by 2 to the power of 8, which is 255, to get the number in a range from 0 to 1. This is useful for converting color data to a normalized range implicitly. The last two parameters are the stride and pointer. The stride determines how many bytes each vertex is. So if a vertex contains a VEC4 for the color and a VEC3 for the position, and both of these consist of 4 byte floats, then the appropriate size would be size of float times 4 plus size of float times 3. If your data is tightly packed, meaning there are no gaps between vertices, then you can just set the stride parameter to 0, and OpenGL will implicitly assume the data is tightly packed. Finally, we have the pointer variable. This simply asks for the offset of attribute within the data. So if you have a structure that looks like the following representing a vertex, then you can use offset of vertex color to obtain the appropriate offset value. If you're coding in Java or C Sharp, then you can just use something like float.bytes times 3 to get the appropriate offset value. After you call GL vertex attrib array with the correct parameters, we need to make sure to call GL enable vertex attrib array attribute location, where attribute location is the layout location in our shader. This makes sure that OpenGL enables this vertex attribute as part of this vertex array object state, which we'll talk about more in just one second. All right, we have two pieces of information. We can create a buffer, and we know how to specify different attributes for a buffer. But how do we tell OpenGL to put these two pieces of information together? This requires one more OpenGL object called a vertex array object, or VAO for short. Now, what's a VAO? It's very similar to an OpenGL buffer in the sense that it has a unique ID which we can use to set it up. The difference is it doesn't store any data that we explicitly send to it, but rather it stores specification data about how we would like our vertices to work. So we can create and bind a vertex array object by using these functions. We are telling OpenGL that we'd like to create one VAO and store the value in our variable myVAOID. Now, remember, OpenGL is a big state machine, so we have to make sure to bind the VAO after we create it. Now that we have the VAO bound, any subsequent calls to create buffers and vertex specifications will be attached to this VAO. If you would like to unbind the VAO, you can use the same function with zero as the VAO ID like this. So let's put all of this information together and come up with a vertex specification for our hypothetical vertex structure we defined earlier. We can do something like the following. Cool, so we have this data that we just uploaded to the GPU and we'd like to draw it. But there's one more catch. We can't draw this data until we have a working shader. Unfortunately, creating and compiling shaders deserves its own video, so we won't discuss how this works. However, I'll have a minimum reproducible example for compiling a shader linked in the description. You can copy that code for now and play around with the attribute locations, and we'll explore how that code works in the next episode. All right, so once we have the shaders compiled and linked, we need to draw this data. How do we draw this data? Well. Since we stored all the relevant information about this data in a vertex array object, we can simply tell OpenGL that we would like to draw the data associated with this VAO. We can do that by calling these functions. First, we bind our vertex array. Because remember, OpenGL is a big state machine and we need to ensure we have the correct global state set up. Next, we bind our shader program. You don't have to worry about this too much for this episode because we will go over this in more depth in the next episode but you can copy some code I have linked in the description and just call compile at the beginning of your program and call shader.bind whenever you'd like to bind the shader. Next, we call a new function, glDrawArrays. This function takes in the primitive type as the first parameter, the start index as the second parameter, and the vertex count as the last parameter. So if our vertex array contained more data, say 20 vertices, and we specified 14 as the start index and six as the number of vertices, OpenGL would draw the vertices 14 through 19 in our array. 
And if we had triangle set as the primitive mode, then it would interpret these vertices as two triangles, since a triangle has three vertices each. Finally, we have all the knowledge available to draw our first triangle. Now, you'll run into an issue pretty soon. The problem is duplication of vertices. Oftentimes, you'll want to draw a specific shape that consists of several vertices, but share a lot of those vertices among the triangles that compose this shape. Take a star for instance. A star has 10 unique vertices, but if we were to draw that star using 8 triangles, we would need to use 24 vertices. A lot of these vertices would share the same data, so we're duplicating a lot of data for no reason. If only there was a simple way to remove this duplication. Wait, OpenGL already thought of how to solve this. Remember how I mentioned we would be using GL element array buffer? Well, now's the time to introduce this functionality. An element array buffer is a way of telling OpenGL that we would like to reuse some vertex data that we've already specified. So, we can tell OpenGL we have 10 unique vertices and buffer that data as part of our VAO object for our hypothetical star. Then, we can use the following set of commands to create an element buffer to help us out. This syntax should be pretty familiar at this point. An element buffer is just another buffer. So, we can use the same syntax to create the buffer and bind the buffer. Finally, we can buffer the data the same way we did with our vertex data. The only question is, how do we specify what the elements should look like? Well, the OpenGL documentation specifies that elements can only be an unsigned short, unsigned int, or an unsigned byte. But where do we declare what type of data we're using? I'll be honest, the OpenGL documentation is not very helpful in making this connection, but you can specify the type of data you're using when you draw your elements. So, Say we had elements specified for our hypothetical star that looked like this. We've specified these vertices that are unsigned ints by using the type uint32t. Now, as we upload this data using the function calls we talked about a moment ago, and as long as we created this buffer while a VAO was bound, this buffer will be related to that VAO. So we can draw all this data using a different function in OpenGL like this. As long as you have a VAO bound that contains an element buffer when you call this function, OpenGL will draw the vertices according to the elements specified. In this case, we will draw triangle primitives, and we'll draw 24 of them since we have 24 elements. We specify that they are of the type unsigned int, and lastly we provide an offset into our index buffer. If you set this to 3 for example, then it would start drawing from the third index in our array. The reason the documentation says this is a pointer is because you can pass your element buffer directly to OpenGL here. However, this isn't a good idea because it needs to upload that data every time you call this function. So it's best to think of this parameter as an offset into your element array, which is where you would like to start drawing from. We've covered a lot in this tutorial. Unfortunately, in order to draw anything to the screen in OpenGL, you have to know all this prerequisite knowledge. However, here are some challenges that should reinforce your thinking and how all of these concepts work, and then I'll talk about a more modern technique for accomplishing this same process, and I'll give you another challenge to try and do this more modern technique called named buffers. Here are your challenges. 1. Draw a square on the screen using GLDrawArrays. Remember, store your vertex positions in normalized device coordinates, which range from negative 1 to 1 in the x and y directions. 2. Draw a square on the screen using GLDrawElements. 3. Draw a star using GL draw elements. 4. Draw the outline of a square using the GL lines primitive. Complete these challenges real quick to solidify your understanding of these techniques. You can find code to set up shaders by going to the link in the description, and if you have any trouble completing the challenges, you can look at my code for a reference. Now, let's talk about named buffers, which are a more modern technique of setting up buffers. You could achieve the same result we did above using named buffers, which are a bit safer to work with since you don't rely on any global state. Let's look at this piece of code. This probably looks pretty familiar, but there are a few key differences. First, when we buffer our data, we can't specify what kind of buffer we are dealing with, so we must call one of the GL vertex calls. As an example, you can see that I buffer the element buffer object using GL named buffer data. I called GL vertex array element buffer and specified the VAO and EBO IDs. This lets OpenGL know that our buffer with the EBO ID is in fact an array element buffer. You'll notice that below I use GL vertex array vertex buffer for the VBO. This lets OpenGL know that the VBO ID is an array vertex buffer. There are a few extra parameters in this call as well, 
we have to specify the vertex buffer binding, which is basically like a slot that we tell OpenGL this buffer will be attached to. This will be useful if you want to specify multiple buffers for different attributes. You'll notice that further down we use the same binding point when we call GL vertex array attribute binding. The last two parameters in GL vertex array vertex buffer are the offset and the size of the stride respectively. The offset is useful if you place multiple buffer attributes in the same block of memory. You can usually leave this as zero and move on unless you have a specific need to change it. Finally, when we set up our vertex attributes, we can use the function GL vertex array attrib format, which allows us to specify the VAO this deals with. After we set up the attribute format, we must call GL vertex array attrib binding to specify which buffer slot this coincides with. And we can finally call GL enable vertex array attrib, which allows us to finalize this vertex attribute. This is all a bit complicated, so don't worry if it's difficult to grasp at first. If you prefer the first method of setting up buffers and attributes, that's fine as well. I just wanted you to be aware that there is a more modern technique to this whole process. With that said, here's one more challenge for this episode. This challenge encompasses the named buffer technique I just described. Feel free to give it a shot since this is the more modern technique for OpenGL, but don't feel obligated to use this technique if you prefer the non-named buffer technique. 5. Repeat the star challenge, but use the named buffer technique we just talked about. I've tried to make these challenges utilize most of the knowledge you should have gained from this tutorial. As always, if you have any trouble completing the challenge, check out the description for a link to my solution to see how I did it. Of course, there are many ways to accomplish this, so my solution is not the only correct solution. If you have one that you'd like to add to the description, reach out to me on our Discord server, and I'll review your code and consider adding it to this list. As always, thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe, and stay tuned for the next episode, where I will be talking about shaders in OpenGL.